Jamstack's been getting a lot of buzz lately. Let's do a high level overview so you can see if this web development and web deployment system is the right choice for your project. Key to understanding Jamstack is understanding the difference between static and dynamic. In the web world, static means that you pre-built or pre-computed something, pre-compiled it. It means that you've done a build phase where you've created something and then put it up on a static hosting system similar to say Amazon's S3. Dynamic is where you're actually building something on the fly. You're computing it in response to every single request. And when you think about it intuitively, it's gonna be a lot faster and a lot cheaper to respond with something you already know as opposed to computing something on the fly in response to every single request. So some things have always been static. That would include things like JavaScript, audio and video files, or CSS, which is how we do fonts and typography and layout. And if you're thinking to yourself, whoa, wait a second, hold up. JavaScript is dynamic. Well, it's dynamic on the page and in, in its behavior, but the code itself is always going to be consistent from release to release of a piece of software. So a good rule of thumb around this is anytime you're computing something in response to a request, you're gonna have a performance or a scalability problem. If you can pre-compute the response, even if it's for a short period of time, you're gonna be better off. So an old school web server has three primary jobs. Serve HTML, serve static assets, and serve API endpoints. Nowadays though, all your static assets, again, JavaScript, CSS, audio, video, that's all gonna be on something like Amazon's S3. And when it comes to APIs, we've already moved those off onto other servers or a set of servers if you're doing the microservices thing. So that leaves the web server doing just one job and that's serving HTML pages. And it brings up the question, can we make those pages static? To understand that, we need to understand how a web server renders an HTML page. So let's say the customer is looking for a widget. So they go to slash products slash widget and that request goes to our server. The server then connects to the API, asks for the data on the widget, and then it formats the HTML response and sends it back to the customer fully rendered. Over the past 10 years, we've been moving more towards client-side rendering. In that model, the user makes the same request to the server, but the server responds with a, essentially a blank page and a reference to a JavaScript application. That JavaScript application then makes the request to the API. That API responds with data, the client code, that JavaScript then formats that data and renders it into the experience on the client. We, that's why we call it client-side rendering. But there's a third way, a new way where during build time, meaning in response to data changes or in response to code changes, we a server goes and gets a list of all the products from the database and then uses a set of templates to format and a site that has all of that in it. All of those pages are completely pre-rendered and those go up on S3. Now when the customer goes to that page, you immediately get back a page that's completely rendered. The beauty of this is that you only have to render that data once into HTML. In the other models, client-side rendering and server-side rendering, you render that HTML every single time, regardless of where it's being done. It can be done on the server or it can be done on the client, but you're doing it in response to every single request. A key element is that every customer is going to get exactly the same HTML page for a given URL. Okay, now be fair, this particular example doesn't really look really good for client-side rendering. Let's take a different example, like a customer settings page. So in this model, the person hits the settings page from their web browser, the server then responds with a blank page and again that JavaScript app that then goes to the API, gets whatever the current customer settings are and renders a form. Exactly the same thing happens in the client side model with the exception that now we can return that host page off of S3. And the exact same thing again happens in the static site generation model. So in this case, essentially, static site generation and client side generation are exactly the same. They can both be hosted off S3. It's only the server-side model that's still computing response for every single request. So in two of these models, client-side rendering and static site generation, we can get rid of that web server and save ourselves a whole lot of money and time. And that's really what we wanted to do, and it's what Jamstack is all about. So Jam is an acronym. The J stands for JavaScript, the A stands for APIs, and the M stands for markup. 
HTML is the hypertext markup language. In order of execution, it's actually markup JavaScript and APIs. So ideally it would be mja, but that doesn't sound so good. So we're just gonna go with jam. And then in terms of the stack, well, anytime you've got a bunch of technologies and you put them together, uh, some guy's gonna call that a stack. So Jamstack is a way of using markup, the HTML, JavaScript, and APIs to give you a complete application without ever having to have a web server. So the advantages here are threefold. It's better performance because anything you can serve off of S3 or any kind of static hosting site is always gonna be faster than something that you can serve off a web server. Second, you don't need to monitor any servers anymore, right? It's, it's going to be there. If it was there yesterday, it's gonna be there today as long as you keep paying the bills. And third, it's just much more secure. It's really hard to hack a server that doesn't exist. So now that you understand more about what Jamstack is and what the advantages are, the next question is, can you get there? Well, if your server is already just responding with a host page, then it's pretty easy to just put that up on S3 and point your customers at it and away you go. But if your web server is making API requests in response to every single URL request, then it's gonna be a bit more complex, but it's definitely doable. So there are a couple of different approaches you can take here. One is to use what's called micro front ends. Micro front ends are where you leave spots on the page and then code running on the client goes off, makes requests and formats HTML that would then go into those spots. Another option is what's called edge side includes. So if you have a content delivery network, CDN, that sits between your customer and your S3, you can use edge side includes to inject material into the page before it gets sent to the customer. So, and a good example of this is like, for example, a header and footer. You just, just statically generate the site without any headers or footers, and then it's edge side includes that inject the header and footer right before it goes out to the client. The really cool thing about that is that you can then go and update the header and footer outside of any release, and the customer will see those changes right away. And there are a lot more ways to do it than just these two. Basically what I'm saying is you can add dynamic behavior to a statically generated site. It's not a problem. Okay, so we've covered what Jamstack is, we've covered why it's good, and we've a little bit of cover about how to get there. I guess one more question is, why haven't we been doing this forever? I mean, something like S3 has been around for about 20 years now. What's different now is that we've rethought where we do the rendering and we've given ourselves the option of either doing that rendering on the client or during static site generation. And this has given rise to a whole bunch of new platforms, services, and APIs. On the platform side, we have new platforms like Hugo, Jekyll, and now Gatsby. On the services side, there are sites like Netlify, now.sh, and Zite. And on the API side, there's AWS's Amplify and Google's Firebase. Both of these give you a whole host of services, but they also allow you to have a, essentially a hosted database where you have create, read, update, and delete functionality baked right into the API. And it's API that you don't have to build yourself. Honestly, with all these tools, it's just a really great time to be a web developer because you can go and build really cool apps and get them deployed quickly. Okay, on to some frequently asked questions that I just kind of made up. So first off, how does this relate to React, Vue, Angular, you know, the choice of a front-end framework? Well, honestly, it doesn't. All of those front-end frameworks allow you to build a static site and get it deployed to S3, but Jamstack is just an architecture. It actually isn't specifically tied to any one of those things. Now, when it comes to static site generation, the static site generators are generally tied to a specific front-end technology, like Gatsby is directly tied to React. Another question is, would your application have to be a SPA or a single page application in order to do Jamstack? And the answer is no, but if it is a SPA, it's probably gonna be a little bit easier to get there than if it's a traditionally structured application. All right, here's another one. Does your application have to be on Docker in order to go on Jamstack? Nope. How about EC2? Nope. You don't need a server, so no server technology is gonna be required to get there. All right, here's another question. Do you have to use a Jamstack service provider like Netlify? And the answer is no, although they are cool and they have some good tools and you might wanna go check them out. And then I guess the best and final question would be, how do I start? And really that depends on what your web server is doing today. If again, if it's just doing a static host page, that's really easy to port and get out there. If it's doing something more complex, then you need to look at what it's doing and see how you can 
get the dynamic behavior and translate that into a static behavior. I mean, you need to move that logic around. And you've got tools like micro front ends and edge side includes and just JavaScript in general that can help you do that. In that process though, you're probably gonna have to go through some business analysis and think about it for a second. So you got a product page. The product page has imagery for the product, you know, a nice, nice snapshot. It's got a description, it's got a title, uh, and it's got a price. And of those four things, right, your image, your description, and your title are probably not gonna change. They're basically static data. The price, however, might be variable over time. So what you're gonna wanna do is go and render that product page with the static data, and then somehow find a way to inject the price either as an edge side include, or with a micro front end, or whatever, as the customer gets the page. Well, I hope this overview has helped you get some notion of what Jamstack is, what its advantages are, and maybe if it's gonna be interesting to you and your project. If you like this video, please hit that like button. If you really liked it, I'm always down for a subscribe and new subscribers. And as always, I really want you, in fact, in particular on this one, I want your comments. This is the first time I've done one of these high level overview videos and I, I just wanna see from you guys, you know, did I hit everything that you needed to know? Are there things that I left out? Are there things that I didn't go into enough detail on? If you can leave stuff like that in the comments and just tell me or ask me questions, that would be fantastic. All right, folks, as I like to wrap up every video with, just be kind to one another.